doors. Okay. And so when I was praying through this little snap vision of doors, I saw doors that were easily opened that the Lord opened for us. You know, there's some doors that are closed and there's some doors through um, life that the, do the Lord begins to open up for us. Right. But there were some doors that remained closed and no matter how hard I kicked them, no matter how hard I beat on them, they weren't, they weren't open, but they had my name on it. And I'm like, I can't get in. I'm supposed to be in there. Why can I not get in? And it didn't matter what I did. So after praying about it with the Lord, the Lord says, daughter, there are some doors that I will open for you out of your obedience, out of your prayer, out of your character, you're ready. There are some doors that will not open because others have the keys to those doors that you were to be partnered with. They own the keys. It's your door, but you ain't getting through that door without them. The light bulb went off because I had been preaching and studying about the wise and the foolish. And I understood that there's some things in life that the Lord allows us to do on our own. But there's a many other things that require the fellowship and the partnership of others. Whether they're above you in wisdom, whether they're lateral to you in wisdom, we need one another. It is the ecclesia. It is the fellowship. It is the church. Okay, so we have the foolish that we talked about last week, which is the foolish virgins, they're unwise, they lack understanding, and they lack discernment. That's just the definition of foolish. The definition of wisdom, deep understanding, keen discernment, and a capacity for sound judgment. I mentioned last week that the difference between the wise virgins and the foolish virgins is what the wise were just extra. We're extra. We do, we go above and beyond the norm of what's required of the kingdom. We understand more, and even though the blood is enough, the cross is enough, he's, all, he's enough, period, the end of discussion. But inside that blood covenant, we have all of these extra attributes that are available to us. All right, they come with the contract. And that is the anointing. That is healing, praying for people and they get healed. That is prosperity in finances and health. A lot of people say prosperity is just tied to money. It's not. It's prosperity in all aspects of our lives. It is health. It is finance. It is relationships. Prospering in those things is of God. The gospel is prosperous. Okay? Now, we know that the Lord tells us in Proverbs 1-7 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We know that. So what we can say about the wise virgins is they were full of full of God. That's because God is wisdom. The foolish knew of God. They have God. They're saved. They were invited into the wedding, right? But there's some things that they don't have access to and they're not qualified for because they didn't do extra. They weren't full of God. They were foolish in the things that they did. They were foolish. When we first get saved, you are saved. Wise and foolish. They're both saved. They're virgins in the Bible. But they truly lack wisdom. I know when I was first saved, I was saved. I was going to heaven, but I was dumb. I was so dumb. So were you. We made the stupidest decisions. I am looking at you. <laughs> we were. We, we, came, we came flying into free chapel on just on, on two wheels, you know, coming out of an addiction and just broken and just at rock bottom, still smoking and probably still smell like bars and alcohol and God, good knows, Lord, you know what we were, we were dealing with. And we were saved, but it didn't mean that we had wisdom. It, it didn't mean that. It meant the Lord promised that when we professed with our mouths, we believed in our hearts, that he was Lord, that he was going to save us, and we were saved. But it didn't mean that we had wisdom. We were far from it. And it took many years, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about the, the, the walk into maturity, the walk into wisdom, because it takes a lot of humbling yourself. It takes a lot of partnerships of people that can open these doors that are shut to you. It takes a lot of um, dying to self. It takes a lot of study. It takes a lot of buying into wisdom, and I'll get to that. So um, let me just go ahead and just fast forward all the way up to when... I got baptized at Free Chapel in 2014. We had been going for about 18 months, all right? And this is why the revival right now at Free Chapel is so personal to me. This is why. 
Um, some people at Christ Fellowship, we've now been there for five years, and I have been pre three, three, four. Are we going on four? I think you've been there five. Are we I going on four five. years? I got there at the end of 2018. Are we coming up on four years? Have we almost completed three years? It just feels like I've been there forever. Okay. My husband says three years. I think it's more like You're four. working on the end of three years. Thank you. I think it's more closer to four. But before that, before that, <laughs> before that, we didn't just come out of nowhere. <laughs> Let me just make up some numbers because <laughs> it feels like forever. But before that, it's not like we just came out of nowhere. And I, and I want to bring that up. You know, sometimes people think that people emerge on the scene out of nowhere and they're just preaching and they're teaching and they're all over the place. And you're like, where in the world do they come from? Um, Sean and I came from Free Chapel and that is why it's so personal to me about this revival because we came in knowing absolutely nothing and just believing that the Lord said he was what he was going to do and, and, and do in our lives. And it was about 18 months before I was baptized at Free Chapel. Um, I had thought that I was already baptized. So every single time that we would be at church and Jensen would talk about, oh, we're having a baptism or service this whatever day. And I'd be like, okay, cool. Good for them. I was baptized when I was a little baby. I don't remember it. I don't know. Maybe we have a picture of it. My grandmother said they sprinkled water on my head. I don't know. I mean, I didn't know anything. But the more that the, I, we kept going, we were, we were, very, we were very disciplined. We, all, we went. We went every Wednesday, every Sunday. All right? Uh, they put you in no longer bound. They pay for it. They pay for the whole thing. Remember that? Yep. Right? We were very, very dedicated. But eventually I ended up getting into the water. So did Sean. And that is the night you guys know that I became mantled to preach. But I cannot tell you that I was any good at it. I can't tell you that I even really knew anything. And it's like the Lord gives us mantles to see what we're going to do with them. Right? I feel like like this was, like say this this is a baton. This mantle was handed to me. When I went under that water, like say this water bottle, right? I went under the water at Free Chapel because I felt the Lord pulling me into the water to get baptized publicly. And I came up out of the water and I didn't really feel anything different. So I go home and then all of a sudden I start reading my Bible and I understand it. All of a sudden, it's bur the word is burning inside of me, and I got to tell somebody. Well, Sean doesn't ever really want to hear it. So what would I do? I would go on my phone. Before we had lives, we didn't have lives. We just had phones, and then you could, you could upload a video to Facebook, and it would take like an hour. But I did it anyway, and so I would do these messages. I think my very first message on Facebook was about the, the pigeons that the Lord released, and then everybody ate it, and then they died, right? It was really just not even a very encouraging word. But I preached it. And so that was what I was doing. It was doing. good to you. It was it? good to me. And so that was back in 2014. And so here it was. So here's this baton that I got coming out of this water. I was totally mantled. I was totally different. And I would look at this baton going, yeah, I'm mantled. I don't know what I'm looking at. Like, what is this? I don't know how to use it. I don't know how to do anything with it. Like, I just have this mantle. And that is how it was with Elijah and Elijah. So, who remembers the story about Elijah and Elijah? You do. You do. Okay, well, let me tell you online. So, basically, let, well, let's just go read it. Kings 19. Open up to 1 Kings chapter 19 if you have your Bibles here or online. If not, I'm going to read it to you. Starting in verse 15. Now, I want to show you how we can be mantled, and the Lord just looks at you and goes, so what of it? I gave you this. What are you going to do with it? Right? And it's up to you to pursue what the Lord has called you to do. And you're not ever going to get a blueprint for it. You're just not. <laughs> you're just not. So here, we're going to start with what Elijah did to Elijah. All right. Then the Lord said to him, to Elijah, go return to the way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Ye Jehu the son of Nemeshi, as king over Israel, and Elijah, the son of Saphat of Abel. So he departed from there and found Elijah, the son of Saphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Just 
you know, he was walking, Elijah's like plowing, that's just what he does, he's doing his thing, and here comes the prophet, everybody knew 